Today's uh, title, the sermon's title is Miracles. I love to talk about miracles. How about, do you like to hear about them? Do you like the miracles? You know, I just believe that God, I feel so strongly God not done doing miracles. Yeah. How many of you still need a miracle or two? How many miracles? How many? Yeah, I need them. I'm going to ask you again. How many of you need a miracle or two? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell the Lord how many of you need the miracles. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, like how many of you believe that Jesus is someone that we should be passionate about? Amen? You got to be people that respond passionately, not just shy. How many of you need miracles? Yeah, passionately. I need a miracle, God. Yeah. And Jesus has another miracle in, sto on, in story store for you and for me, I believe. Now, uh, we're going to talk about one of the most beautiful miracles in the Bible. It in Second Kings. We are in Second Kings chapter four. We just read the prophet name is Eliza. Now today I want to talk about the title message is like it's like one of the beautiful miracles. There are in two story. One of the story is the the beginning of two, Second Kings chapter four, the story of a woman who was one of the wife of the prophets. And the husband died, leaving her with two children. Now the creditor came and said, if you don't pay your bill, I will take both of your kids and make them slave. So she was in desperate. So she came to prophet Eliza and said, what do I do? They're going to take my son. They're going to make them the slave. How can I pay my bill? And the prophet said, what do you have? And she said, I just got a jar of oil. And he said, now you go get empty jars. Not a few. Get many. Get as many you can. Go get big bottles, baby bottles, anything you can get. Get anything. Just get a bunch of vessels and bring them home. And when she said, when she, said, she, when she did, he had now take the oil, that one, <clears throat> one jar of oil, and start filling them up. And that, <clears throat> sorry, and jar did not empty until all of jars were filled. And she said to her son, she said to her son, bring next jar. And he said, that's all, mom. We don't have any left over. And that all we collected. And it was then the oil stopped it. That was a miracle. She was a woman that needed a miracle. She knew she needed, so she got one. Then the prophet, prophet said, now go sell that oil and you will be able to live on that. The problem solved. What a wonderful miracle of provision by God. Amen? God gives divine provision for those of us that are willing to work for it. Now you notice the miracle came not by her just sitting there, going. Come on, God, I need a miracle. She just, she just did pray. No, she was going out, getting bottles, building them up, getting another one, building them up, getting another one, filling up. And what was happening? The miracle was taking place because she was involved. 
Now listen, one of the things of the miracles, miracles is this. Why should God answer a prayer that we don't want to be involved in? Why should God give us provision and in an area that we refuse to contribute anything to? And so God is saying, when I call you to do something, jump in. Because you are posture, posturing yourself for a miracle. You are part of miracles. So first, miracle happen when you are in birth. So miracle happens when you are in birth. God is saying, I'm not going to do it alone. I'm not going to do it alone. We are going to partner together. Because it God and you, then makes a majority. God and you, not God alone. You know, he can do it alone. He can do everything, but he would let her do it with you. And so this woman was doing something. Now there is a, another woman in the light after her story. So when she needed a miracle, she participated, and then God gave her wonderful miracles. And then the next miracle, the story, right after her story, the very prominent, wealthy woman. Now this woman needed a miracle too, but she had no idea that there was even a remote possibility for a miracle to happen. So, Second Kings chapter four, let's start about the verse eight to ten. We'll see what unfold before we before us here. Okay. So, Second King verse chapter four, chapter four, verse eight to ten. Let's read, let's read together. Start. One day, Eliza went to an swimming where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continuously passing our way. Let us make a small room on the loop with the word and put there for him a bath table, a chair, and lamps, so whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Amen. So now one day, when Eliza passed over the Shunam, the Shunam, and there was a wealthy woman, and she persuaded him to eat food, and so it was so as often he passing by, had passed by, he turned in there to eat their house. She, also, she always persuaded Prophet Eliza, come my house. Eat my food. You know, I don't, I don't know about you, but uh, when I travel, like travel to another city or state, I would let her stay in a hotel because often the people, the congregation will say, hey, you're here to speak. Why don't you stay at our house? I would rather not risk their culinary skill. <laughs> because sometimes they have very unique taste, tasting plates that they want, me, want to try on me. So like, hey, they make with the vinegar and baking soda, lemon juice, and a little bit of sausage, date oil, put the olive oil, and they... My dog liked, so she put in the, some chicken liver, and then she boiled it and said, my dog likes it, and you should too. <laughs> no. <clears throat> so I would let her just stay in the hotel and take my least chance at Dennis better. That was joking. Yeah, nobody. <laughs> <clears throat> so she had to be persuaded to eat the Elisha. Well, but it must have been good because 
It said, as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. One day, she said to her husband, now I perceive, I perceive that there is a holy man of God passing by us continuously, continually, so I tell you what, let's make room for him. So they decide, instead of sending him to Shunam Sheraton or Shunam Holiday Inn, she decides to make something out of her saving account and seize an opportunity to serve him. So they make a loom. They build a little audition for him. It has a bed, lampstand, table, a chair. He can sleep there. And I thought that was pretty cool. Now, this is a great woman. And one of the things I love about this woman is she didn't give to God to get from God. She didn't say, you know, I'm going to build this room and see what going to give me. No. You know, if I do this for God, then he must do something for me. So I'm going to give to get. I'm going to do something for God because I need him to do something for me. No. No, no. She just, she was up, just willing to be the part of God's plan. God was doing something on, on, in Shunem. This man was coming through preaching and he, she said, I want to be part of God's plan. And that's the, that was her great hurt. She wasn't, was not trying to give to God. She just said, I want to be part of what God is doing here in my village, my town. How many of you want to be a part of what God is doing? <laughs> How many of you believe that through this place, God's going to do a great thing in Tacoma? Amen. And around the world. And, and we want to get involved. Amen. So, second miracles happen when you make room for God. Why? Because the people somewhere around you, sitting around you, look at you. Somewhere along the line, in the beginning, they made room for God from this church. That's why we are here. We didn't try to maneuver God. We cannot maneuver God. You can you can not make God to do anything. But you know what she did? She made a room for God. You understand? You can cry, you can pray, you can holler, you can spit and fume, but you cannot move God. But here it is, but you can make you can make room for God to move. You cannot make God move in your life, but you can move room for God to move in yours, in your life. You see, we sometimes try to make God move. It's not going to move. But I can make a room for God to move. And then God begins to do something great in your life, in that place, when you make a loom. And that's exactly what this woman did. Amen? She just make something for God. She just do something and look around you. Because these people who are sitting around you, that sacrificed their time and made room for God. That's why we are here. Some of your church members sacrifice. Some of your, and you, you participate, you make the room for God in here. That's why we have this wonderful congregation, this church in here. Now, here is the magnificence of God. Let me keep reading it. You're, you're going to love this. Second chapter, 
Second Kings, verse, chapter 4, verse 11 to 17. I'm going to read. One day he came there, and he turned into the chamber and rest there. And he said, Geachi, his servant, call this Sunamite. When he called her, called her, she too stood before him, and he said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble for, your, for us, what is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or the commander of army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? Keachi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. Not your story. He said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, At this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, O man, o man of God, O my God, do not lie to, my, to your servant, maid servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time, the following a spring, as Eliza had said to her. You know, you see, he said to this woman, hey, you need to do, let us do something for you. He's laying in the bed and he's thinking of a, of a way that God might bless her. You know, God is like that. Did you, did you know that he's thinking of the way to bless you? Sometimes we think God is laying there thinking of ways, ways to get down on us. We are thinking that, that God, you must be thinking of a way to get us. You know, like sort of like, let me give, uh, let me give Jimmy a flu or cold or teach him the lesson. No. Let's break his leg so he can go where he shouldn't. No, God's not like that. God loves to bless his people and he's doing, he's going to figure out way to do. And he said, there's a many times during the day that God think about us again and again. He always think about bless us. Now, now I, want you, I want you to just kind of hang on there. Remember, the prophet Eliza hit the nerve and he said to this woman, you're going to have a baby. Now, he's taking a big risk, the really big risk. Because anytime you talk about woman, about reproduction, I think you should keep those time limited to minimums. So because of, of the things I, I've learned, is you never ask a woman, if she is pregnant, as you never ask a woman, when are you due? Because uh, you have 50, 50, 50 chance of being wrong. <laughs> and if you are wrong, you have 50, 50 chance to being a mother on the spot. So don't ask, lady, are you pregnant? No, <laughs> you're gonna die <laughs> if, you, you, if you made a wrong. And this prophet takes a huge risk and talks to her about reproduction. And she said, I'm good. I live among my own people. You know what she was saying? My neighborhood, they are all like me. In other words, I live in gated community. They are all great people like me. I'm good. I don't need any miracles. I'm good. And then prophet say, no, no, no. You don't have a son this time, but next year you're going to get a son. And she say, no, I'm good. I live in the gated community. I'm prominent. I'm good. And the prophet say, no. One of the things that I think that makes Eliza such a great prophet, he, he just could see ben, beneath of the surface. He saw her needs. He saw her 
beneath human suspicions. And he's saying, God still has something more for you. And she said, no, no, no. I'm good. Oh my God, you're going to lie to me? You... I'm suspicious. I'm suspicious. I live in a great house. I have a great salary. Suspicions. I have I drive a suspicious car. I had a suspicious retirement. I have a sufficient husband and wife. I have a sufficient dog. My neighbors are great enough. I'm good. No. God's goal is not self-sufficiency. It's what is divine proficiency. I got enough, I could say, there's nothing left, nothing, I, there, not, nothing I'm, I'm not going to need anymore. This is where I'm supposed to be. And God say, no, don't settle for less. I still have more for you. There are, there are things string in my heart for you, and this is just for the beginning. My goal, my goal for you is not self-sufficiency. It is divine proficiency. And she said, I don't need a son. I don't need anything. Why? Don't you go lay back down in your room and watching TV or do some jacuzzi. Don't mislead me. I'm good. See, something happened in, in this woman's life. She keep rejected it. Maybe it was deep-seated disappointment in her life that taught her the deny anything pertaining to this part of her life. We don't know, but she's saying, don't play with me, my mind. Don't mess up my mind. Maybe you've, you've tried in the past and I failed. Maybe she tried to get a baby when she was last time or past. But Somehow, she didn't get it. She got disappointed. So she given up. Sometimes we just give in a hope. They not change. Just we settle for less, like her. Because we got disappointment. We got fail in the last, I mean the past. And God is saying to this lady, don't you settle for less. I wonder, as I look at our church family, I wonder sometimes what objections do you and I have have become our natural response to the promise of God. We got enough. We are su sufficient. This is good. That's enough. And God saying, God is saying, why is that for less? When I have so much more for you. More than you, you will ever imagine. Oh no, I have got enough. I have got sufficient stuff. We are good. I don't have any I don't have ambition because I'm not a boy. I'm pretty old. Only boys can be ambitious. No. That's exactly what this woman did. She said, "Well, you know, I don't want to be. Oh, I don't want to be. I'm disappointed because if I put my heart in this way, and it doesn't come to pass." I'm going to be disappointed. So don't mess with me. Don't mess up with me. So you know what? I'm not even going to hope that way. I'm good to go. If it has happened, great. But if it doesn't, it just don't want to be disappointed again. I just don't want to be disappointed.
to so born again as I have. That happened in our life, huh? How many of you guys give up and something you you failed at in the past? Sometimes a child or some condition in our family has been this way for a long time. Something that God has promised for you and your kids, and you're you're just not working in it right now. And so we settle for less. This is good. This is enough. I done. I I done with my kids. I done with my family. I done with my jobs. Now we are suspicious, suspicious. or maybe a love that was in your marriage when you went to the altar and said, I do. And it's no longer is there. And we say, well, whatever. It's good. And we settle for mediocrity in our marriage, in our family, even in our church. And God is saying, who taught you to settle for less. I taught you to contend for more. You're not that young, but you're not that old. I love Eliza because he just keep right on going. He said, you're going to be have a son in your arms in next time, next year, in this time next year. How many times she rejected it, objected? God, but God wants something more for her and more for you than the confines of your past that you can get beyond. It could be an addiction. It could be something that you have struggled with. And you will struggle with it for so long, for so long, you say, well, just that, just how it is, and you said it for less. So I do that stuff, well, no. And you start to settle. Can you see the subtly, can you see the, the enemy, the Satan, trying to get you to settle for less? He whisper you, that's enough, no more. You're done. Why you try to get your family back? Why you try to talk your kids again? They're going to fight. They're going to they're gonna give you a disappointment again. Why, why don't you give, give it up? Because what happened in the, that the life will give you whatever you settle for. You, you settle for less, your life's going to be settled for less. Don't give it up. That's why Elisha, he tried to tell her, no, next year, this time, you had a baby, you had a son. If you settle for less or mediocre family, that's why, that's why it will happen. If you settle for mediocre church, that's why we will have one. But God is saying, no, you don't settle for less. You contend for more. That is your faith. As is thy pace, so shall it be done unto you. And God's going to have a way of going right to those places where we put, keep outside. Think about the courtroom. It's like God is the judge, judge, and God say, Jimmy, I want to move further into ministry, or you into ministry. And we say, you know, I, I was just talking to guy the other day. Well, he said, I can do. He said, because I'm. I'm not just not qualified for that. 
I've got something in my past. I fail. And I could just hear the Lord stop and say, Objection of a Lord. He said, Don't you think the blood of my son is enough, strong enough, pure enough, powerful enough to overrule that? Doesn't the scripture say that if we walk with the light as he is in the, is in the light, then have we fellowship with one another? And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleans us from all how all how much all how much he cleans us from our sin lord i know okay i try but i really want be that much of success i i i can just hear i can just got here said god said obolu objection obolu you can do it because I will supply all you need according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We keep saying we can do it, but God keeps saying, Ob objection of Lord, you can do it because you're my son and daughter. I choose you. You did not choose me, I choose you, and I appoint you that you should go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. When you are weak, you are strong, and it is in your weakness that my grace comes through it. It is not by your power, but by mine. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. So whatever our objection is, you can hear God say, objection of Lord. Are you glad for that? Amen? If you object, if you reject so many things in your life, God still said, objection of Lord. Keep trying. Be ambitious. I had an objection to God's call hundreds of times. I do so many times. I can do God. It's not enough. But he keeps saying, objection of the Lord. So I love that story. She does the, after that, next year, she delivered the baby. And that another story. She does give birth to the son. And when the child was grown, the, what the day came that he went out his with uh, his father. And he said to his father, the son said his father, father, I got a headache. My head, my head. And he said to his servant, the father, he said, carry him quick to his mother. And when he had taken him there, brought him to his mother, he sat on her lap until noon, and the baby, the son, died. Something happened, had happened in her life. He had a miracle. She got miracles. So she delivered the baby. But when he grown, he got sick and he died. He died. I want you to see that there is a big difference between process and purpose. Sometimes you're going to go through the process, and you think, is it, is it this it? And God is saying, no. This is just a process. You don't see the purpose. The purpose is a lot bigger. The purpose is I'm going to teach you something. 
they're going to be something that will actually develop in your faith. Third miracle happened when you have hope. Second Kings, verse, chapter 4, verse 32, 32 to 37. I'm going to read first. When Eliza came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked one back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehachi to say, call this Sumanite. So he called her and when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up, picked up her son and went out. That was second miracle. See, to me, it's a picture of Jesus. When he got up on the cross and stretched himself out to cover your sin and mine, the Lamb of God, and he said, mouth to his mouth, and eyes to his, his eyes, and hands to his hand, and heart to his heart. It's almost like you and I were dead. Dead and promise of God were dead. The sin had taken everything from us, and his mouth on our heart bred life from the dead. That was in my life. My mouth was exchanged for the life in his, the eyes of mine, which couldn't see anymore, that he exchanged and gave me a vision. My hand, which could not move, he put his strength on mine and exchanged his strength for my weakness. And my heart, which had stopped beating, he put his heart on mine and begin it again. I want you to see that there is going to be times in our life where our dreams are going to die and you will be blind. You will not be able to see. You won't be able to speak. There won't be life in your mouth anymore. You look at your hands at, and say, you say, I used to do stuff. I can anymore. I can. I don't have any ability. And the heart that I had for ministry or the heart that I have for my kids or the heart that I had for my marriage, the heart that I had for my God is not there. And I want you to know that God stretched out he wants to stretch out his life over yours. He wants to stretch out hope where you have only fear. He wants to stretch out, stretch out confidence over you and me where there is no confidence. Then he wants to stretch out peace where there's just chaos. And he touched us again and our heart begin to beat again. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And you might have a dream that you had that's not there anymore. I want you to know that Jesus wants to come into your life and even though you have got objection, he will just say to you, I love you. I mean, 
I've been trying this. No. You can do it. You can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. Don't give up. Objection overrule. You can do all things. God, but I don't think I could ever get out of this hole. No. Objection overrule. He said, I will supply everything you need according my riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Not yours, mine. Not yours, because of mine. But the promise that you gave me is that I don't have heard for this anymore. And Jesus said, Would you allow me to stretch my heart over yours and then my heart begin to beat with yours again? And I will exchange my life for yours, my sight for your blindness, my strength for your weakness, my breast where you have none. And if you will let Jesus do that each time we gather, and if we, we will be willing to make room for the miraculous, we can do it. But if you will let him, he can. Make room for the miracles and watch Jesus is about to do another miracle. And when you think there is no hope left, he's about to do another miracle in your life. When you think there is nothing left, hope is gone, Jesus will say to you, I got one more miracle left for you. I have got another for you. Because I got a whole shelf of the miracle. I'm waiting for people who will make room for the miracles. And Jesus is willing, are you? Are you willing to that? Are you? Now go ahead. You're going to be willing to that. God's going to give you an awful miracle. Are you willing? Amen? Go ahead. Give him a clap of praise. God, guys, hallelujah. He's going to give great miracles.